Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Would you give the team a hand for a great job today? Well, we are so glad to see you. You notice the Green Shirt Brigade on the stage and out here. We had a women's retreat this week. Lindsay was our leader, and they had a great one. And we're going to see and hear more about that later. But we're so glad you're here. You're watching, listening online. Thank you for joining us and being a part of our service today. How many of you have ever heard of the Northern Lights? You heard of the Northern Lights? The northern lights are beautiful, they're mysterious, there is some scientific reasons for it that I couldn't explain to you if I knew why, but they actually showed up in Ruston this year. Did y'all know that? Did any of you see it when they did? I saw it on Facebook, which means it has to be true, right? <laughs> right, but that, they did, and, and they're, they're, they're beautiful. You know, the lights, lights uh, do get our attention. Christmas lights, the northern uh, lights, those things they do. And, and in, our, in our scripture today, in Matthew 5, we're concluding our series, Real Christianity. We're going to look at lights. It was the theme of our women's retreat, and so I'm going to piggyback with them on that today. So if you have your Bible, Matthew chapter 5. And here's the first thing that Jesus says. He says, you are the light of the world. Now, what in the world is he talking about? What, what does that mean? I mean, is that just religious talk with no real-life application? No, it's got a ton of real-life application. And, and 2,000 years ago, the Jewish people hearing this originally, uh, it would have resonated with them because they, they talked about light and the spiritual impact and meaning of light. They said God the Father was light, and we would agree with that. They, they said Jerusalem is the city of light. Not just Marshall, Texas is the city of lights at Christmas, but that Jerusalem is the city of light to draw people to it. They said the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuter- uh, Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy, <laughs> That's Hebrew. I learned that in seminary. And, and Numbers <laughs> uh, were, were also <laughs> the light of the world. And, and, and then if you, I'm going to give you a number of scriptures today. So you might write some of these down, look them up later. In John chapter 1, when Jesus came into the world, it says he is the light. He's, he's coming as the light and to be the light. And in fact, in John chapter 8, verse 12, here's what Jesus says about himself. Jesus spoke again to the people and he said, I am the light of the world. So wow look in verse 14 with me and you'll get a wow you are the light of the world a town built on a hill cannot be hidden that word you is plural in the bible so he's talking about more than one person or word thing and let me tell you what he's talking about he's talking about christians If you're not a Christian today, what we're going to see is what Christianity should be like. So you go, well, it's not. Well, it should be. And we're we're trying to be. It's what church should be like. And we're going to see see this. That that the Christians, you are called to be the light of the world. This church, a church, is called to be the light of the world. The word light there is, uh, is un- it's one that's not kindled. It's one you can't put out. It's a supernatural light. The word world, when you see that in the Bible, it means one of two things. It either means the sum total of people, like John three sixteen, for God so the world, or it means the, the material world we live in. And it, it's both here. We are the light of the world. A town built on a hill could not be hidden. Now, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, it's, it's kind of weird. You look where Jesus grew up in Nazareth. To get to Jerusalem, you go south, you go down. But Jerusalem is up in elevation. I think God planned it this way. So almost any way you came into Jerusalem, you're going up when you go to the city. And it was on a hill. And the, a lot of the buildings were limestone. So even at night, if it was a, a clear night with a big moon, you could see Jerusalem from a long way uh, from the reflection off those limestone buildings, but, but you could see the light and you got complete darkness and you, you, you see this city on a hill, you could see the light. So this, this had to really get their attention. And, and Jesus again says, you are the light of the world. He didn't say politicians are the light of the world. 
He didn't say Republicans or Democrats are the light of the world. Now, folks, politicians play a big role in our life. You know, fundamentally, why? Because they got a lot of power. But Jesus said, you are the light of the world. And this is not a question. This is not like, well, that's not my gifting. You know, that's the kind of stuff we hear when we ask people, can you greet and hand out bulletins? I'm not gifted to do that. We're not asking you to sing a solo at the opera, okay? Jesus isn't asking a question. The question is, will you be this light? Will we as a church be this light? And, and here's what lights do. Listen, we putting practical feet to this. We are meant to be positive difference makers. We are. How many of you have watched much of the series, The Chosen? What I've seen has been great, and I, I haven't seen anything I would say, uh-oh, that's not true. My friend Steve Lee, who's sitting here, I think he's still awake. Normally he goes to sleep about in the third point. But he said about the Jesus character, who I think is betrayed, in my opinion, pretty accurately. He said, he's the coolest guy ever. And, and I think he was talking about the real Jesus. Now, you old-timers, of course, I've never seen this in person, but just I've heard about it. The old-time Chad, that really wasn't meant to be funny. Uh, <laughs> Bet you can't do it again. <laughs> and Sarah is going, why do I sit with my husband? Why do I sit with my husband? Okay. Chad, you completely derailed me. <laughs> Hold on a second. Let me... If in doubt, you just say, and for God love the world, right? Okay. The old movies, Jesus was a strange character. He had a, a, like a globe around his head and he walked like, he was a zombie. No one was attracted to him. The real Jesus was the coolest guy ever. You old timers remember Fonzie? Jesus was cooler than Fonzie. And look in verse 15. Neither do people light a lamp. Man, you want to be light, you want to be seen, and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. A lot of their lamps were, were literally a bowl with oil in it, and they had a floating wick. And you got to remember, it's hard to get something lit. It, it, if you're a Boy Scout or something, you can probably do it. But like if I'm out in the woods and I don't have anything to light a fire, it's going to be a cold night probably, or you're eating the hot dogs raw. You can do that, I promise you. And so to get it lit was hard. And when they got it lit, when you, when you had that lit, their houses, most of their houses were one-room houses. With, they were small. They had one window. They had one window in it. And so circular window. So even, even when the daytime, it, it was kind of dark. It, it was kind of dark. So they get that lit. And when they got that lit, they didn't stick it under the table, did they? They didn't hide it. You put it on a stand where it could give as much light to everyone as, as it could give. And when they went to bed or when they would leave, instead of blowing it out, because remember, they didn't have a Bic lighter. They weren't like having a Marlboro and they could light it. So they don't want to have to relight it again. So they take a measuring bowl from the kitchen, and it's all one room, and they put it over it so it won't smother it, but so, you know, something won't flicker out and start a fire in the house. And, and Jesus' fundamental point is here is the church, our church doesn't need to hide its light. We need to shine bright. You as a Christian, you don't need to hide your light. The whole purpose of light is to shine and to shine bright. Verse 16, he says, In the same way, you let your light shine like a lamp, light on a lamp stand before others, so they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. If you're taking notes, that word shine means to be bright. It means to radiate before others, that they may see your good deeds. If you're taking notes, please get this, because this is so important. Christians miss this all the time. The New Testament was written in Greek, and there's two different Greek words for our one English word, good. One word is, is if you took it from Greek and spelled it in English, it would be agathos, A-G-A-T-H-O-S, and it means good in quality. That's important, morally good, ethically good. That's good. But the word used here is the word kalos, K-A-L-O-S, and it's not only good in quality, but listen, it means beautiful, attractive, and winsome. Beautiful, attractive, and winsome. 
let your life be beautiful, attractive, and winsome as a Christian so that others will see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Now, over in Matthew 6, it says, don't do your good deeds to be seen by men to get praise for yourself. It's like today, I don't need to go home, get on Facebook and say, man, I preached an awesome sermon today. People's life were changed. But God be the glory, right? I'm humbled by it. Some of you are going, you're a liar too, right? I didn't even get that, but that's fine. I'm wanting to shine, to shine it back on him. He says, I want, you, I want you to live a life that is positive and attractive. I want your church to take good, strong, clear stands. But I want you to be a church that is positive and attractive. And so our next question is this, what, what, what do we do? What, what is meant to be a difference maker? How do, we, you know, how do we go about this? What do we do? What does light do might be a, a way we would say that. How do we make that positive difference? Well, I want to give you four things. And I'm not saying these are the only things, but they certainly go with it. Number one, we expose danger. We expose wrong and danger. I want to show you a video that, that will help you appreciate light exposing danger. I'm out here in the Florida Everglades and I'm surrounded by alligators. Check this out. Don't try this at home. I've been sitting here making a baby alligator call and they all come right oh, up to oh, me. Oh, 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 oh. There is over a hundred here, but I got like 30 or 40 right next to me. Look at this. They all freaked out when I stood up and they realized I wasn't a baby alligator. Well, good for you. <laughs> okay, if you were with some of your, it's an, it's an all guy trip, let's say, a deacon trip, and we're, gonna, we're just going to do a little skinny dip and late at night. Aren't you glad? Very bad thought. Aren't, <laughs> aren't you glad they shine the light? Somebody say Amen. Hey, I think I'm just going to bathe in the water. And then, you know, you're mauled to death by 40 alligators. Light exposes problems. Hey, we live in a world that's got a few issues. Isaiah 520 may be the verse for our country right now. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Listen. I believe God gives a person a free will. If they want to choose a wrong path, they can. There's consequences with it. I believe God gives people a freedom, and we in America, the freedom of speech to say, hey, this is right when it is wrong. But what they're wanting us to do now is say, yeah, you're right. Not only do you have the right to do that, but we've got to say it's okay that what you're doing is great, even though we know it's wrong. We can't do that. Do you hear me? As a church, as a Christian, we got to be loving, but we have to shine the light. Listen, you want to know if you're intelligent when danger lies ahead, and light does that. That's one of the things that light does. Here's, a, here's another thing we, it light does. Man, light, light shows the way. It shows the way. What's more valuable, your, your, your GPS on your phone or your lights at night? I'd submit it's your lights. Especially if you're on a back road or someplace you don't know well. Man, your, your lights, your lights show you the way and what's ahead of you. In Psalms 119, 105, they're talking about the Word of God. Your Word is a lamp for my feet and a light on my path. Wow, God says the Bible is a light, but he says you and I are. Are y'all getting how cool this is? Jesus says he's the light, but you're the light. The Bible says it's the light, but you're the light. Light shows the way. Take, write this passage down if you would. Romans chapter 10, verse 13 and 14. Romans 10, 13 says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Wow. One of my favorites. But verse 14 says this, How can they call on somebody they hadn't heard of? How can they believe if someone doesn't tell them? Light shows the way. Listen, people are going to hell without Jesus. One of the reasons this church exists is to tell people about Jesus and his salvation. As a Christian, that is one of your purposes too. Here's a third thing. Man, light gives warmth. It gives warmth. Okay, why do you think bugs fly to lights? They're stupid and they get zapped and they die. That's one reason. 
<laughs> now, this is speculation from intelligent people, not your ministry team. No one's ever interviewed an insect and said, give me the reasons you fly to the light. But here's, here's two reasons they speculate. It's warm. It's warm. When I was a kid, I cannot, well, not a kid, I was a, young, a teenager. My parents from about 13 on let me camp out with other teenagers by ourselves and start fires. And we lived to tell the story. And that fire represented a lot of things, but one thing it did is, is that the monster probably wasn't going to get you if you were near the fire, and it was warm. The bugs fly there because it's warm. You know another reason they speculate intelligently that bugs go to lights is it's safe. Because in the darkness is where the spider webs are and the things that eat bugs. And, you know, our church, and I don't mean this in some kind of politically correct, strange way, we're, we ought to be a safe place. No matter what your struggle is, no matter what's going on in your life or your family, you, you've got to be able to come here and be loved and accepted and cared for. You don't have to approve of wrong and sin in my life, and I don't, we can't as a church approve of it, but we can approve of you and love you. And, and we, and some, some churches are so cold, you could skate down the, the aisles. And I'm not talking about the thermostat. I'm talking about the, 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 the warmth and the heartbeat of the church. Man, we, light brings warmth. Hey, are you a warm person? Are you a safe person for people? That's what light is. And here's the last thing, man. Life, life gives hope. Life, we, we point to and we give hope. In verse 14 again, you are a light of the world, a town built on a hill, and it cannot be hidden. Jewish men had to come to Jerusalem, no matter where they lived in this part of the world, three times a year for all the festivals. And a lot of times they would, of course, bring their families with them. So here you are, you live where Jesus lived, and you've got to travel four days with your wife and with your kids and probably extended family and in-laws by donkey and by foot. Oh, my. And your kids after day two are like, are we already there? When are we going to be there? When are we going to be there? So you step by the Jordan River and baptize them four or five times. But can you imagine you're, you're exhausted, you're tired, maybe you think you've gotten a little lost, and there you see Jerusalem. Man, the lights are shining, they're bright, and you know you're almost home, you're almost there. And, man, that's what Christians are called to be. That's what churches are called to be. We point people to the light. We point people to hope. Boy, oh boy, do we need that today. Listen to these statistics. This is this year. About 8.5% eight, eight to 8.5% 8, 8 of adults in America are depressed. So I guess that means there's somebody in here that's depressed from the waist up or the waist down. I don't know. Half a person. But the, the stats get worse 20% of our 12 to 17-year-olds are depressed. 22% of college students are depressed. There's a di uh, disorder that's popular, popular, or it's more common this time of the year called seasonal affective disorder. It is uh, caused by a lack of light. When things are darker, you go to the North Pole or the South Pole, places where they don't have sunlight for two or three months a year. You know what happens? People drink a lot, they get high a lot, and they get depressed. And there's literally a, a device that people can put in their house. It's called for light box therapy where, where it mimics natural light, which helps people with depression. And I think, my goodness, that's our job. We're to point people to hope. We found the answer. We, ha we found the answer. Let me share with you a story from the London Times. This was in 2008. A, a guy named Matthew Paris wrote an article, and the title of the article was Africa Needs God. He starts the article by saying, weird title for me since I'm an atheist. He said, I've been to Africa many times, and I cannot deny what I'm seeing. People are becoming Christians and they're changing their villages and their communities and their towns. 
He said there's a positive, winsome attractiveness about their Christianity. I, as an atheist, cannot deny it's making their world better. Africa needs God. Folks, that needs to be us. That needs to be you and me. That needs to be our church. 1 Peter 3.15, listen to what it says. But in your heart, set apart Christ as Lord. And always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason that you're so grouchy for God. That you're so holy and hateful. That's not what it says. That's how we are. But that's not what it says. The hope, the joy... Be prepared to share that we, listen, we have found the answer. We say we have. And, and, and that, that needs to be a positive attractiveness about us. And, and, and like light, we point people to the hope. We point people to the answers. Man, light does so many great and wonderful things. So let's answer one last question. How do we shine? How do we shine? This is an optional this isn't optional. This is not like, well, I don't want to teach or I don't want to sing in the choir or the praise team. I don't want to be like, this is not optional. This is what God's called us to be. I want to give you two ways, two fundamental ways. Number one, it's supernatural. It's supernatural. It, it, it's God's light. In verse 16, we'll look at it one more time. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds. The word light there. Literally means the light that, that can't be kindled. It's, it's always been, and, and it'll never go out. And, and it's not the sun. Did you know the sun is going to die? How many of you knew that? I mean, don't get your funeral clothes ready. It's like 5 billion years from now, and I don't mean to be calloused. I'm not super worried about it, but it's going to run out of hydrogen, and then global cooling will start, right? Yes, Pastor, global cooling will start in a big-time way. But the light of God, the light of God's always been and it always will be. And, and the light that can, can be in you and in me is not a light we can start, but it's not a light that can be put out. How do we get this light? Uh, it, first of all, it starts with your salvation. The reason so many churches are dead, not bright places is they got too many people in the churches, running the churches that don't know Jesus. And the reason that so many Christians don't manifest those positive, attractive characteristics is they don't know Jesus. Listen, when you get saved, you get Jesus. And, and take this down. Remember that John 8, 12, when Jesus talked about him being the light? And, and that light's going to be in us. He said that. In 1 Corinthians 6, 19, it says, You as a Christian, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. God lives in you. Who is the Holy Spirit? He is the Spirit of God. He is God in spirit. He is Jesus in spirit. When the Holy Spirit lives in you, God lives in you. Jesus lives in you. The Spirit of God lives in you. God lives in us. And when God lives in you, he ought to radiate out of you. Radiate means it starts in the center and expands. You can't keep God contained. If enough of us in this room have God in us, it ought to come out of this church. We radiate God, but we reflect God too. You know, the, you're familiar with the moon. Did you know the moon, and I don't mean to be ugly, it's just really a, an ugly rock in space. I mean, it serves a great purpose. If it's gone, we're dead. God put it there for a reason. But, but the, I saw the moon this morning about 7 o'clock. Man, it's beautiful. Full moon, beautiful did you know the moon has zero light? Gee, all it does is reflect the light of the sun. Moses, in Exodus 33 or 34, went and spent a lot of time alone with God, and he came out, and his face was glowing. And the cool thing is, he didn't know his face was glowing. Like, he didn't get on Instagram or Facebook and write, hey, man, so humble, my face is glowing with a selfie. And, 
And, and the point there is, listen, for you and I to be light, it's, gonna, it, it's gotta take something supernatural. That's possessing God, walking with God, living with God. And when you do that, he can't help but come out of you and you can't help but reflect his glory. It's supernatural. It's supernatural, but it's practical too. It's practical too. Let me give you some practical steps. Number one, be obedient and holy. Be obedient to God. You've got to obey God. You've got to live a life of obedience. In John 14, 15, Jesus said, You are my friends if you do what I command occasionally. You are my friends if you do what you like to do that I tell you to do. No, you are my friends if you do what I command you. You can write this down in 1 Peter 1, 16. Jesus tells us to be holy like he's holy. And holy doesn't mean weird. It, it, it just means that we're, we're different in a good way, that there are things we don't do. There's behaviors that we don't stay in. We may fall and trip and stumble, but we get up and we try to head in the right direction. Listen, you can't be dirty, immoral, and unethical and shine very bright. If you don't believe me, get a flashlight tonight, put it in the ground, take it outside, and put dirt all over it. There'll be some little bit of light coming out, but not much. And when you clean it up, you know what? It shines bright. You got to be obedient and holy. Here's the next thing. Love people. Love people. Matthew 22, 36 through 40, Jesus gave the most important commands. Love your pastor and tithe. If you didn't laugh, you don't know your Bible very well. <laughs> Jesus said the most important things are love the Lord your God with all your heart and love people. You can't shine if you don't love people. By the way, God said you're going to hell if you don't love people because you're not truly a Christian. Bingo. How do you love people? Man, you're kind, you're nice, you serve, you help. You're not a jerk. J-E-R-K if you're taking notes. You're not that. You love people. Let me give you two things that come from love that I, I'm fixing to start preaching to you. These are pet peeves. You smile. You smile. Everybody, all at once, look at me and smile. Some of you are... <laughs> Did you know when you smile, it, it, it releases endorphins? You feel better. You ought to wake up every day and just walk around the house for th <laughs> smiling. But I, I want to tell you something. Man, you can't smile at people. How can you say you love them? Your scowl does not demonstrate the fruit of the Spirit. Well, I just struggle with it. Well, stop struggling. <laughs> this isn't calculus. It's not my personality. Oh, baloney. If God lives in you, you've got his personality now. Amen. Push yourself. Smile at people. You're lazy. Some of you are lazy. I don't know. I say Russ Golden. He's lazy. I know that. Do you know it takes 43 muscles to frown? Think about it. It does. A smile is 14. Just because you're lazy, smile at people. <laughs> Don Ritchie is called the Australian Angel. This is such a great story. Where he lives in Australia is the number one place of suicides. It's a, it's a place where there's a high cliff and Many people have come taking their lives. Don said, I'm going to do something about it. They believe in the last years he's helped save 160 lives. What's his secret? Well, he goes out and quotes Scripture to them, tells them they're going to go to hell if they do this. Nope. He said, I just walk out and smile. When they catch my smile, they'll turn. A lot of times I'm able to get them to come to me and we go have coffee and they walk away and live another day because he smiled. Because he smiled. Be friendly. These go together. Be friendly. So in our next point, be friendly. I want to ask you a serious question. How can you say you love people and you can't speak to them? Here's what I hear all the time. Well, I saw them and they weren't friendly to me. And my question is, did you speak to them? Well, no. They're at home right now talking about you. <laughs> I'm telling you, when Jesus walked down the highway or the hallway, he was smiling and speaking to people. 
I try to do that. And when they don't smile and speak back, it hurts my feelings. It didn't hurt Jesus' feelings. He just probably said, I know their heart, they're an idiot, but that's okay. I love them anyway. I came to die for idiots, right? He, if he didn't, many of us are in trouble. How can you say you love people if you can't smile and be friendly? Somebody say a loud amen. amen. It drives me crazy. Now, some of you are going, well, I want something deep. We need to talk about prophecy. No, you don't. If you fail 101, you don't jump to 401. And I am for prophecy. I'm for deep Bible study. I've spent my life, that's what I do for a living. I spent seven years in seminaries, which are sadly some of the most unfriendly places in the world. Preacher training. I can t honestly say I know some very deadly serious pastors who pastor seriously dead churches. You want to you be a church that draws people in? Man, let's have fun here. Let's, ha let's have life here. Let's love people. And people can walk away and say the, mu the music was good, the preaching was poor, but people love me, they'll come back. And I would say fire the preacher and get another one, but that involves me, so I don't want you to do that. Be friendly to people. And lastly, have fun and enjoy life. Ecclesiastes 11.8 says, However many years anyone lives, let them be miserable and find everything wrong with everything and be unhappy. It says enjoy them all. These are true stats. Kids laugh about 400 times a day. Adults laugh about 15 times a day. There you go. And for some reason, we think it's mature and cool and godly to be holy and unhappy. I've heard people say, God's called us to be holy, not happy. That is baloney. God has called you to be both. The fruit of the Spirit is love and joy. Joy is synonymous. It looks like happy. It just comes from a different place. It comes from God, the light in us that can never be extinguished. Wow. Enjoy life. Enjoy life. I wanted us at the end of this service to sing the, the old song, This Little Light of Mine. And I asked Gabe, our contemporary worship pastor, about it, and he humbly said, Chris, it's too hokey. Can't do it. Can't do it. He laughs at the wrong time. If you're new to our church, we do pay him. This is, uh, he's a, <laughs> you bring, hey, you're bringing joy, embarrassment to your wife, but joy to me and to everyone else. <laughs> you know how it goes, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. It's what God's called you to do. Maybe this morning the Holy Spirit has convicted you that you don't belong to Jesus. And that, that is a terrible space to be in, but it's so fixable. Come give your life to Christ this morning. We'll talk to you after church. We'll, we'll, I'm going to pray with you online and in here in a moment. You can do it today. Maybe you'd like to.